Every morning we wake up to a world of obstacles, a world of adversity, a world of fear and doubt. We're faced with hard choices and tough calls. And every day we press on. Every day we push and pull to make something of ourselves. And far too often, we fall. And we ask ourselves how. How did I get here? How did I fall this far? How do I get back up? The answer is not strength. It's not willpower. The answer is faith. Faith that what you're made to do is worth doing. Faith that the one who made you will show you how to do it. Faith that the one who picked you up will not let you fall again. Because the walk of faith is not just a walk. It's a climb. Good to have you tonight. Uh, if you have your Bibles, your electronic devices, you can go ahead and either click to, turn to Genesis chapter 13 is where we're going to, is we're going to journey through tonight as we've been looking at the life of Abraham. As you know, several weeks ago, I kicked off this series called The Climb, uh, looking at living a life of faith and what does it mean to live a life of faith. And so this week, the title of this message is called On Sight, in which that means making a climb when, when you do not know how. Um, and, and that's really a, a, a different definition of faith, is that it's doing something that you don't really know how, and, and really and truly all of us as believers should be in that position in our life, to where we're, we're trusting God for something, we're, we're, we're on this climb, we're, we're on a climb of faith, and so maybe, maybe this evening you'd say, you know what, I, I'm on a climb of faith. Uh, maybe it's a, a challenge in your life. Maybe it's something God has called you to. Maybe it's something that, that you're launching out in and you're just trusting God for. But every one of us believers, we should be on a life, a climb, a climb of faith of learning what it means to trust in God um, and making that climb even when we don't know how. That was Abraham's story. If you, if you were with us when we started out in, in the journey of Abraham, we know that God told him to, to leave the place where he was, the place that he knew, his friends, his family. And he says, and go to a place where I will show you. And so Abraham had to totally depend on God, on this life of, of faith, and we, we, we should be the same way. Uh, when, when, when we first moved to, uh, to Pueblo, Colorado, we were only here a couple of years, and, and Karen heard about this issue of like people enjoyed like climbing 14ers, and that was like fun to them. And so Karen thought it would be fun to her, or, or for her. And so uh, she wanted to climb a 14er. And so you know what? Uh, I don't mind driving to a 14er, but I do not, I do not understand why you would want to like hike a 14er. And so we, Karen found some friends, and so we didn't know how to make the hike, and they told us like the gear we needed to take, the food that we needed to take, and, and then, you know, you got to get up really early because of lightning above tree lines, and you guys know all this. We didn't, I'm a Texan, and so like we didn't. And so, so we, we made the climb, and we didn't know how, but we were trusting in some guides, trusting in some friends to guide us along the way. And so in case, if you're wondering, uh, everybody made it but me. And so, uh, so fortunately in my backpack, I had a fly, uh, a fly rod and some flies. And so uh, when I came to my first high mountain lake, I says, you guys go ahead. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'll be plenty happy here. And so they went up and they came back. And so, so this issue of faith is we should all make it, be making a climb. And it's a climb in which we, we really don't know how, but we, we trust in God. And so, so if you're making that climb, which all of us should be, I want to give you just a few things out of Abraham's life uh, that, that we, can just, we can hang on to tonight. Uh, because, because an, an own sight is, is like demonstrated in our lives a few different ways. One is this. The first one is this, is when we're willing to submit to God in worship. And we just come to that place to where we're willing to submit to God and worship, to where we come to that place and we admit that, you know what, I, I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to, I don't know the, the, the answer to this challenge. I don't know how to take the next step. But God, 
you, you have the answers, and you know, so I, I'm going to trust you. And so we're willing to submit to God and worship. Abraham, Abraham didn't stay in the land where he was. I mean, he journeyed with God. He, he journeyed to, to Bethel, and, and where he had, he had once built an altar here in, in Genesis chapter 13, 1. Here's what the scripture says. So Abram went from Egypt, he and his wife, and all that he had in lot with him to the Nedgeb. Now Abram was very rich in livestock, in silver, in gold, and he journeyed on from the Nedgeb as far as Bethel to the place where his tent had been at the beginning, between Bethel and Ai, to the place where he had made an altar at first. And there Abram called upon the name of the Lord. In other words, this is a time of, of deep worship. And you may think it's, it was a time of like stopping or resting. But this is really a time of, of, of like returning to the Lord. This is really a time of like meditating. It was a time of, of maybe reflection for Abraham. And maybe it was a time that he, he praised Abraham and he thanked Abraham. Remember, if you were with us last week, you're, you know that last week is when like Abraham like sinned. I mean, he, he lied and he had his, his wife to, to lie. He, he, he only cared about himself. It was his selfishness, and he only cared about his well-being and everything working out well for him. And he, and he put his wife in a, in a difficult situation, in a compromising situation. And as a result of that, man, God spared him. And he returned to the place to where he had once is, uh, had worshipped. And, and he, well, he was probably thanking God that God, even in, even in my disobedience, you were with me. You never left me. You never forsake me. You continued with me. God, you forgave me. God, you protected not only me, but you protected my my family. I mean, this, this, this phrase in the Old Testament, call upon the name of the Lord, is another phrase for prayer, but it's like this. It's like this. It's like this deep prayer. It's like this deep connection with God. And see, see, he went back to the place to where God had last spoke to him. He went back to the place. He, re- he returned to the altar. And he took all of his junk and he took all of his stuff with him. See, Abraham was known as a friend of God. In other words, he had a friendship with God. He had a relationship with God. And he, he returned to the altar and it, if you're, if you're going to submit to God and worship, there's, there's three different areas. There's three different ways that we do that. The first one is this. You submit to God and worship with, with, with your time. In other words, with, with, with Abraham, you just look. It, it not only had to be a, a priority with him, but it, it, it took time. And, and you submit to God and worship with your time to where, where worship for you and worship for me is like, it's like a priority. It's like a non-negotiable in our, in our life. I mean, it's, it's, like, it's, like our, it's like our highest value. And you see that he, he, it, it took time for Abraham to build an altar, and it took time for him to stop, and it took time for him to worship. And, and obviously Abraham made this a priority in his life because you see this continually through Abraham's life. And, and Abraham was like the, the spiritual leader of his house. I mean, I mean, when he led them back to the altar, his family went with him. Lot went with him. And, and so he was leading his family. And so you submit to God and worship with your time. And when you take time out of your schedule, then you make it a priority where you withdraw from the world. And listen, you do this privately and publicly. And privately, we, we take time out of our day and we, we, what we call here, we, we life journal uh, to where we, we just simply life journal through the scriptures. And in a year, we read through the entire Bible. And we pull away and we spend time with him and we allow the Lord to speak to us directly through his word. And, and so right now, it's just such an interesting time in life journaling life. And if you're not doing that, you can ask one of us. You can go to the, uh, the, the Welcome Center. Is that what we call that still? Okay. Uh, <laughs> for some reason, it just sounded wrong. Thank you. And so you go there. There's people there that would love to help you. And we're, we're <laughs> sorry, I'm still on that. And so we're 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 going through the book we're going through the book of Daniel and the book of Luke right now and in in the book of Daniel we are learning huge principles of what it means to be a to be a Christ follower to follow God in a godless society in Daniel's situation in Babylon 
And all of a sudden you realize that Daniel has like this private worship and this public worship. And, and, he, and he had a priority and he had, he had time and he set aside time. And all of a sudden you realize in these scriptures that, that we learn. We learn even in a godless society how to make decisions, how to respond to government, how to respond to others, how to, how to live out our faith in, in front of others that is not so divisive, but it's, it's almost attractional as a life that, that Daniel is, is, is living. And there, there's, there's something about this issue of private worship that is so important. I've, I've told you this. A lot of times I, I, inter, I, I use worship music, whether it's, whether it's Pandora, whether it's YouTube or whatever, and I use worship music within my private worship, and it's just, it is like so meaningful and I believe this, that, that private worship is a platform for your pl- public worship. There is something powerful about private worship. But there is also something powerful about public worship or corporate worship. Man, when we as believers, when we gather together, and I can, I can like see your worship, and you can see my worship, there's something encouraging about that. And a couple of weeks ago, I, I was down the front row, and I was worshiping and next to someone. And since I don't have their, their permission, I won't, I won't say their name. Uh, but but when, the, when the worship was over, I, I turned to that individual. And I said, I just want you to know, your worship encouraged me tonight. And it, 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 it ministered to me tonight. Yeah, there's something powerful about this issue of private worship and public worship. See, Abraham, Abraham had, had both, and it was a priority in, a, in, a, in his life, and, and Abraham was, was this guy that understood that, that this issue of worship is, is we, we, we worship with our time publicly and privately, but we also worship with our time when, when we serve him, when we, when we find a ministry, and we realize, see, Abraham... One of the things that impresses me about Abraham, and I hope it impresses you as we, when we get all the way through his life, and you see this is something consistent in his life. Abraham, Abraham not, never got over the fact that God blesses, blessed him to be a blessing to others. It wasn't all about Abraham. And the blessings, how God blessed him, it wasn't only for him. It was this issue to where he understood, he understood that he has a responsibility that as God blesses him, that he like, he like blesses others. And Abraham lived this life, he lived this sacrificial life, he lived this life in wealth and in prosperity, and when he had little, you just see it in his, in his entire life, that he lived this life that he was not only surrendered to him, but, he's, but he lived this sacrificial life, he lived a life dependent on him, and he understood that, listen, it is not all about me. And Christianity is not all about me, and it's not all about you. And the, one of the ways that we also worship him is with our time and finding a ministry and ministering to others and, like, serving others. Uh, uh, th- this afternoon, our, our ministry partners, in fact, it was 32 ministry partners, uh, put on a, another single mom's oil change. And, and they, they changed the oil for, like, 48 uh, single moms in, in our community and served, like, 150 hamburgers. And they, they minister to their families, they minister to their children, they minister to the, the single moms. And it, it's so interesting uh, when we have these single moms oil changes because a lot of the ministry partners, you know what they do? When, when they come to church, they're telling me about who they witnessed to, who they talked to, who they encouraged, and how much it meant to, to the, just them. And so part of, of worship with our time is like finding an area to where we, we can bless others. Where we can serve others. Here, here's another one: we submit to God in, in worship with, with, with your treasure. So it's not only your it's not only your time, but it's your treasure. It's not only your time, but it but it but it's your money. And two of the two of the most important things that we have, or maybe two of the most personal things that we have, is 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 our time and, and is our money. And so when when Abraham built this altar, uh, and whenever they built an altar in the in the Old Testament, and worship was involved, it was not only time; it not only took time to build that, but it always it also took money because they would take they would take like their very best, the the lamb without any spot or without any blemish, and, and they didn't they didn't give the one that was sick or like leaning up up against the fence. 
notes or anything like that. They, they presented an excellent offering. They gave their, they gave their, their very best. And in other words, God doesn't want our leftovers. He, he wants our best. He wants our best time, and he wants our best treasure. There's a story that's just fascinating to me. It's the story of David. And 2 Samuel chapter 24 is, is, is the reference, and, and David is, a, is, is, is king at this, t- this time. And God had, God had, God had told him that he, that he wanted him to offer a, a sacrifice on the, on the altar on, on, a, on a threshing floor. And so, so God told David to go to this guy's house and to, to buy the threshing floor for him. And so David shows up at this man's house, and this man's totally freaked out because here, here King David has shown up at his house, his residence, and he says, what do you want? And he says, well, I, I want to buy the, the threshing floor and so, so for, for worship in 2 Samuel 24, 24, here, here's what it says. But the king said to Aruah, no, but I will buy it from you for a price because Aruah want to just give it to him. He said, you're the king, I'll just, I'll just give it to you. It's yours. And he goes, no. But I will buy it for a price. I will not offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God that has cost me nothing. So David bought the threshing floor and the oxen for 50 shekels of of silver. See, this gets down to the, the core of every one of us. When we worship God, it costs us something. A lot of times that's why it's so difficult to give for many and why it's so difficult to serve. Because it costs us something. Priority, time, treasure, commitment. You want to see where your priorities are? You want to see where your values are? It's real easy. Check book calendar. Where do you appropriate your time? Where do you appropriate your finances? And real quickly, it'll tell us where our priorities are. Here's another one. You also submit to God and worship through, through, your, through your tongue. It said there, there Abram called on the, on the name of the Lord. And this means that Abram came and, and he treated God's name with reverence. This is where, he, this is where Abraham may have recommitted his life to the Lord. Remember, he, he came back to the altar. He, he came to the altar, and he had some baggage. He had some sin. He had some issues. And he comes back to the altar, and maybe this was a really emotional time for Abraham, where he asked God for forgiveness, where he recommitted his life to him, where he said, made some commitments to him. It was a time whenever you see in the Old Testament where they'd have that phrase, call on the name of the Lord. It was really placing your dependency on him. That you, you honor God with your words. You honor God with your, your language to where your language is, is different. And people know that because of that, I, I'm, like a, I'm like a Christ follower. Man, our, our time and our treasure and our tongue is like this, is this barometer for us. And so what, what, what are you doing with your time? Where are, where are your priorities with your time? What are you, what are you doing with your treasure? Where, where are your priorities for your treasure? And, and then, then how are you using? And how are you using your tongue? Do people know, you, know that you work with? That you're a believer? Do you know that there's something different about you? Sometimes if we're not careful... We're more passionate about other things than him. Sometimes, if we're not careful, people know all the things that we're passionate about except for him. When you just look at the book of Daniel, Daniel got that. Daniel understood that. Everybody around Daniel knew that he he was passionate about a lot of things. One of the things that he was passionate about, he was passionate about the Lord. This last this last weekend, many of you many of you know some of the story. Um, I I preached here Saturday night. I did both services Saturday night, and then on Sunday, I took my oldest daughter Brittany to a Bronco Cowboy game, and so uh, yeah, 
Yeah, you're only clapping because the, cow- the Broncos won. That's all that I... And it, so it was a big deal to Brittany to, uh, to wear cowboy jerseys, and I sought counsel. And like all the Bronco fans in our church, don't do it. Do not do it. They will pitch you out of that stadium or stadium, like Jerry Jones says. And so, uh, and so they'll, they'll, just, they'll pitch you out. And so we, we, we wore our jerseys. And so, uh, so on our way in, I mean, it started from the moment we got out of the car. I mean, tailgating is a whole nother thing in Bronco land. And so... Uh, I mean, there is community there. <laughs> they have community. And so, I mean, we're walking into the, the stadium. We weren't, we weren't hardly even out of the parking lot. Lady runs over, and, and she had a homemade sign that said, Mama, don't let your babies grow up to be cowboys. And that's it, I said. I'm like, really? This is how it's going to go down? And so, uh, so <laughs> we're, we're coming in down the sidewalk. And you know those guys on those bicycle taxi guys? All of a sudden, a guy screams out, and we're in a crowd, and we're walking in, and a guy screams out and said, hey, cowboy fan. He says, uh, I give free rides for cowboy fans. And I'm like, really? He goes, yeah, I'll take you down to the river and dump you in, and we'll drown you there. That's what we do with cowboy fans. <laughs> I'm like, really? Is this the Christian way to act? It's so, uh, so, so <laughs> we... We went into the game and, and, you know, got in our section, and, and I just need to let you know this. Our section was not happy to see us arrive with our cowboy stuff and our cowboy jerseys and, and, and everything like that. And so, actually, I, I should have I sent the uh, – anyway, you can't see it on my phone. I don't know what I'm doing. But <laughs> <laughs> there's like a guy in front of us, and this guy had issues. Uh, I know that because his wife told me. And so uh, – <laughs> So, I mean, in the third quarter, he asked for forgiveness and the whole deal. And he says, hey, let's be sports about this. I think I have been the whole game. And so, uh, but he was wearing a Jake Cutler jersey. Yeah, and he took, duct, he took duct tape and put duct tape over Cutler's name. So, I mean, man, you just need to forgive. I mean, let it go. I mean, he's with Miami now. Just let it, just let it go. And so... Uh, so anyway, so, you know, it, it, for us, I mean, it was a great game. I mean, we would have loved the Cowboys to win, but I was there with Brittany, and so just a lot of great memories. And, uh, and, but, but I'll tell you this, I mean, everybody knew who everybody, who everybody was for, right? And everybody knew who everybody cheered for. I mean, they were that passionate. I think that's the way we should be with Christ. I, I think we should live... And I'm telling you, I, they, didn't, they didn't matter who was offended. They didn't, they didn't, it, it, didn't, it didn't bother them. I mean, they were passionate uh, for the Cowboys. There were some Cowboy fans there and, and, and a few, and, and so, but they were mostly Bronco. And they, they were passionate about it. And you know what? For, for the most part, it, it was lighthearted. I mean, they, they were hilarious people. I mean, especially after lightning, degre, degre, uh, lightning delay and, and everything else like that. But, uh, but the Broncos Stadium made a mistake, and they played the Chargers song from last week. Go, you know, beat the Chargers, beat the Chargers, beat the Chargers. And I'm thinking, that's hilarious, until a Bronco fan turned around and said, see there, that's how much we disrespect the Cowboys. We won't even play. We won't even, we don't even mention your name in public. I'm like, that is just wrong. And so, <laughs> but that's the way we should live our life. Our, you know what? The people that we work with, it's fine that they know the team that we cheer for. It's, t- it's fine for them to know some of the hobbies and some of the things that we're passionate about. But you know what they should know? They should know the thing that we're the most passionate about is Jesus Christ. Because we are, we are a follower of Christ. We, we're, we're, we're a, we follow him. And that means we're supposed to be like him. That means we're supposed to be aware of hurts and needs of people around us. That's why it's so important for us to understand that God blesses us to bless others. He blesses us to serve others. He blesses us and puts us in positions and gives us platforms so that we can tell people about him. Here's another one when on-site is, is demonstrated. It's when we're willing to trust God with our, with our future. Actually, I think I trusted God with my future going into Bronco Stadium in a cowboy jersey. 
Brittany was so funny. Brittany's like, Dad, I am so thankful the Cowboys lost. And I'm like, what? And she goes, yeah, if they had a won, they would have killed us. And I go, well, <laughs> you're, you're probably right. But, but we're willing to trust God with our future. God spoke to Abraham and told him and said, Le- leave your people, leave your country, leave your people, and go to a land that I will show you. See, here, here's a huge theme of Scripture all the way through Scripture, that we cannot grab hold of our future if we keep holding on to our past. You, you cannot step into your future, and you cannot grab hold of the future that God has for you if you keep holding on to the past if you keep holding on to comfort, if you keep holding on to to, to your stuff, you will never step into the future. You'll never step into the promised land that God has for you. And I get it and I understand the the older I get, the more comfortable I want to be, right? I mean, the more comfortable I want to be. But you look at Abraham's life, and this is why I respect him so much. When he was a senior citizen, he was still like trusting God. He was still understanding that it's a climb of faith and it is a walk of faith. And so, so Genesis chapter 5, verse, verse 5, it says that when Lot went with Abram, also had flocks and herds and tents so that the land could not support both of them dwelling together. For their possessions were so great that they could not dwell together. And there was strife between the herdsmen of Abram's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock. And at the, t- at the time, the Canaanites and the Pezzarites were dwelling in the land. Then Abram said to Lot, Let there be no strife between you and me and between your herdsmen and my herdsmen, for we, we're family. We got this relationship. Is it not the whole land before you? Separate yourselves from me. If you take the left land, if you take the left hand, then I will go to the right. Or if you take the right hand, then I will go to the left. And Lot lifted up his eyes and saw that the Jordan Valley was well watered everywhere like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt in the direction of Zor. This was before the Lord had destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. So Lot chose for himself all the Jordan Valley, and Lot journeyed east. Thus they separated from each other. Abram settled in the land of Canaan, while Lot settled among the cities of the valley and moved his tent as far as Sodom. Now the men of Sodom were wicked, great sinners against the Lord. Listen, even though, this, even though Abraham was Lot's senior, he gave Lot choice. Talk about trust. Talk about trust of your future. Talk about a selfless faith. I mean, this isn't really popular in our day-to-day. We call covetousness. We call it like ambition or, or hoarding. We call prudence or, or greed. We'll call just industry. In terms like upward mobility are common terms in, in, in our, our culture of self-advancement and self-promotion. And we hear a lot where people say, I, I have my rights. And if you don't protect your rights, nobody else will. So you've got to get in there and fight. and You've got to protect your rights. But Abraham, when you look at this, Abraham gave up his rights. Abraham, I don't know what happened in that worship service. And I don't know what happened when Abraham called on the name of the Lord. But Abraham, it's just like Pastor Chad said earlier, Abraham left it there and he came out totally different. He came out with deeper trust. He came out with deeper understanding. He left it at the altar and all of a sudden you see this difference in in Abraham. Because when you look at it, see this is a financial loss to Abraham. Financially this made no sense. I mean, Abraham let Lot choose, and, and so Lot chosen or, or made a choice. And, he, and you know what he did? He chose the, the best land. He chose the well-watered land. And, and in the end, we know the story. It ended up not, not being a good deal for Lot. But Lot only chose it off of the superficial, off of what he saw. And we, we know that it, it also came as an emotional cost to, to, to Abraham. See, Abraham had no family with him. Lot was like his, his nephew, and he, he deeply, deeply loved Lot. But because of Abraham's faith in God and what God had brought him through and how he got it and he understood, God will never leave you or forsake you. God will walk with you, and God will forgive you. You see this change in Abraham, this difference. I mean, 
It's the climb. It's the climb of faith. You see this in Abraham's life, that as we make this climb in faith, we should be growing in faith. We should be trusting God for more stuff next month than we are today. Because he's been faithful. And like Abraham was like the older, he's the father of the clan, he was the most respected. It was, in fact, his lot, when Abraham said, Lot, you choose, you know what, Abraham, you know what Lot should have done? No, I respect you, you're my elder, you choose. Ephesians 4.3 says, make every effort to keep yourselves united in, in the spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. See, Abraham did that. You know what's, going, you know what's happening? They're, they're, they're men, Lot's men and Abraham's men, they were, they were arguing. There was conflict because there was not enough resources in the land. So Abraham did the mature thing. Let's talk about the elephant in the room. There's conflict. We need to solve it. Why? Because we're family. We're brothers and sisters in Christ. We, we have a relationship. Galatians 2.20 says, I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. To where we should be able to live a life of faith but as a selfless life. The third and the last thing when on-site is demonstrated is we know that God rewards those who are faithful. That just circles right back to our definition of faith in, in Hebrews. That we know that he exists and that he rewards those who are faithful. Verse 14, the scripture says, And the Lord said to Abram, After Lot had separated from him, Lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, westward. For all the land that you see I will give to you and to your offspring forever. He's blessing him. Verse 16, I will make your offspring as the dust of the earth, so that if no one can count the dust of the earth, your offspring also can be counted. Arise, walk through the length and the breadth of the land, for I will give it to you. So Abram moved his tent and came and settled at the, at the Oaks of Memory, which are at Hebron. You see that phrase again? And there, he built an altar. See, it was a priority to him. It was a non-negotiable to him. It was something that he had already decided in his family, that they had already decided, we're going to worship. We're going to worship wherever we are. See, by faith, Abraham took God at his word and, and just followed him. When we begin to live for God, it doesn't mean that we're immediately blessed or we're blessed many times in the way that we think we should. But it does mean that, you know what, one day we'll be able to hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. And if we totally trust God and we continually make that climb of faith, then we should catch the world's attention. John, John the Baptist is the one that said, that I must decrease, and he, Jesus, must increase. Jesus, Jesus is the one that says that there's no greater position than the position of a, of a servant. When we understand that we have been blessed to bless, And we understand the importance of just, of just serving. Many counselors, many psychologists, Christian and non-Christian, is so interesting to me. When they have an individual that is depressed, going through a difficult time, 
has poor self-image and some other things going on in their life, you know what they recommend? Go volunteer. Go volunteer. There's something that happens when you know that God has used you in somebody else's life. I've had plenty of conversations with people here at Fellowship of the Rockies that will tell me something that they've done in ministry or something that God has laid on their heart. And they say, you know what, all I know is God gave me this burden. I didn't even know how to do it. I didn't know the first thing about it. And I simply decided, you know what, I'm going to trust him. And then they go on to tell me how they made the climb of faith, what God did in their life, what God did in their ministry. And because of it, their faith is stronger today than it was the day when they started the climb. Have you started the climb? Have you come to the place to where you've accepted Christ and asked him to come into your life for the forgiveness of your sins? To where you followed him in believer's baptism? You say, Lord, to the very best of my ability, I'm, I'm going to make the climb. And I want my faith to increase as I follow you. Do you bow your heads with me and close your eyes?